Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be going through all of the Beethoven piano sonatas, all 32 of them, and ranking them in terms of my favorites to least favorites. Uh, this is obviously very subjective, of course, and the way I'm going to do things is I'm going to be randomly uh, generating a number between 1 and 32 and then picking that sonata. So I figured that would make this video a little bit more interesting instead of, you know, uh, going in order and people forwarding into their favorite sonata and seeing what I decide for that point. So let's jump right into it. I have a random number generator just off screen here and I'm going to roll it and let's see what our first sonata is. Four, the fourth piano sonata in E flat major. The E flat major sonata. Now this is a pretty decent one if I recall. This is at the time it was written, if if not mistaken, this is one of the um, one of the longest sonatas, uh, Beethoven, one of the longest Beethoven piano sonatas that clocks into about um, what half an hour or something like that. It is far from my favorite, um, though I have to admit, man, that last movement though is is kind of fun, but it does drag on a bit. And same with the second movement, um, it's just a little. It's a little lengthy, but again, this is an early sonata of Beethoven, so, you know, all these sonatas are of quality, so, you know, we can't be too hard on them. All right, let's choose another one. Number 10. Number 10, that is part of the Opus 14 set, if I recall. Let me find number 10. It's in G major. I actually kind of like number 10. It's a nice little flowery sonata, and uh, the thing I like most about this sonata is the second movement. The second movement being the theme and variations in C major. Um, I think it's just incredibly funny and humorous. <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely one of those funny sonatas, uh, especially that last chord where it just slaps you across the face with that F, you know, that fortissimo C major chord. Yeah, I'll give it a nice B tier. Let's do another one. Number one. Okay. So the very first piano sonata, that's the one in F minor. Where would I put this? Um... Beethoven's very first piano sonata. I would probably put it around the B tier as well. It's, again, it's not something I find myself listening to every day. Um, it is one of the piano sonatas that they teach in college, uh, in music school, to teach about like musical form and whatnot, especially the first movement. But um, I particularly like the uh, the fire of the last movements, the finale, the, I think it's a presto, if I recall, but, uh, definitely worth a listen. All right, let's choose another one. All right, number two. Number two. Um, I actually like number two a little less than number one and the one A major, even though it is, actually quite a difficult piano sonata actually the first three uh the first three are quite uh challenging i have to say they're not the easiest piano pieces out there especially being the first handful of sonatas that you wrote so um it's got some redeeming qualities it's a little too flowery for me uh, i like much more i'm into the minors the, the dark and uh uh, turbulent Beethoven, uh, so to speak. That's kind of more of what I enjoy listening to from his sonatas. Let's choose another one. All right, number 18. That is E flat major. That is the La Chasse or the Hunt Sonata. That is part of that is Opus 31, number three. And that's actually a really good piece of music. I really like the first, uh, the beginning of it. Uh, uh, the, or at least the opening of the first movement. It's really interesting how he kind of begins on that uh, that six chord, if I recall. And then you have the really quirky second movement, and then the third movement, which is just like a gallop. Uh, definitely fun. I'm going to put that in A tier. That's my first A tier uh, piece. All right. All right, let's choose another one. Number nine. Number nine. Um, ooh, number nine, I almost never find myself listening to. Um, it is, is again, part of the Opus 15 set. Um, funnily enough, this sonata um, was the only sonata that Beethoven, I believe, made into, or he arranged for string quartet, if I recall correctly. Um, but really, it doesn't interest me that much at all. So, sorry. All right, next one. 
Uh, we've got some repeats here. All right, 15. 15, that is the pastoral uh, sonata, not to be confused with the pastoral symphony that he wrote uh, a little bit later. Um, what do I think of this one? It's a nice, well, it's uh, definitely pastoral, that's for sure. Um, I'm just trying to run through it really quickly in my head. Um, I'm going to put it C tier. It doesn't really speak to me very much. It's a great, it's a, it's a very poetic, um, piece of music though. Um, yeah, there's really not much to say about it. Um, that I really, that really stands out to me that I can think of off the top of my head. Dum bum bum ba -da -dum. Yeah, but, uh, but, but, but. I mean, it's, it's just a classic example of Beethoven being a good composer, but really nothing, uh, nothing revolutionary. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. Uh, number five. Okay, I've actually played this sonata, the C minor one, uh, and I might be biased here, but uh, yeah, the C minor one is actually pretty good. The second movement is boring as hell. Um, I just cannot stand the the slow movements of Beethoven's early period. They're just so boring. Um, but when he starts writing quickly and it, it, it gets very exciting. Um, so apart from that, yeah, it's his first piece in C minor. He wrote three sonatas in C minor. Uh, number five, number the, 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 the this one, he wrote the Pathetique uh, a little bit later. And then he wrote, of course, the very last sonata, which is in C minor. Um, boy, oh boy. I think I'm going to, mm, I'm biased. I'm going to put it, I'm going to actually put it above. It's got a lot of energy that, especially that angular, uh, jutting motive at the very beginning. And then the last movement is just a blast. It's an absolute, just joy. Uh, I, I, the thing about Beethoven is he saves the best for last. You know, it's like dessert for the, the last movement. Ah. And he does that more and more as he gets older and older. He just kind of really forces you to stay in your seats for that time. All right, let's do another one. Number three. Number three in C major, much like numbers one and two. Um, this one's very virtuosic. It's very piano concerto-esque. Um, ba -ba -bum 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 -bum. And it's very showy. So I kind of enjoy that. I'm actually going to put it as a high B tier. All right, let's keep going. Number 26. Oh, number 26. I think this might be our first S tier. The E flat major. The Das Liebevoll Sonata. Uh, this is a great sonata. This was written back in 1809 or 1810, somewhere around there. And... This was after Beethoven completed his Fifth Symphony, all those big master, those big concert masterworks that were he's really well known for. And then he went kind of on a hiatus for the next five years with his, you know, you know, trying to strangle or well wrestle custody of his uh, nephew Carl. Strangle, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that actually happens. Um, but anyway, this was uh, this is actually a program piece where. It's it's not very long, but uh, the Archduke Rudolf was a very big supporter and patron of Beethoven's, and they were very good companions and friends. And during uh, the bombardment of the, Neapoli the, the Napoleonic Wars, um, the Archduke and a lot of the aristocrats had to escape uh, Vienna when it was under attack, and apparently uh, Beethoven... Um, was because of his hearing, uh, he was very sensitive to loud no noises, um, ironically so, even though his music is <laughs> very loud at times. Um, apparently, he was cowering with a pillow over his head, um, crying in pain as he, in his brother's basement, apparently, when the bombardment of Vienna uh, occurred. Uh, and this was around that time. So Beethoven was, how old was Beethoven? Um, he was 40 years old when he wrote the sonata. So it gives you some idea. So, um, yeah, definitely an S tier. That's, that's one, especially ugh, the last movement. The last movement of this sonata is such a contrast to what we normally consider Beethoven as. It's, it's just one of those just ecstasy filled, uh, enthusiastic, joyful 
last movements, the return, um, with, with that piano flourish, it's, oh, and it just, it just carries that momentum all the way through. And it's just, it just makes you feel real good. All right. Enough about this one. Let's go to the next one. Ooh, number 11. Okay. Number 11 in B flat major. This is, uh, this is fun. This one's fun. The B flat major sonata. Uh, this was, oh gosh. I like this one. This is almost like a precursor to the Hammerklavier Sonata. Hmm. I'm going to put this in an A tier. Um, ooh. Do I like it more than 18? No, I don't because of the second movement. Again, the boring second movement of number 11. It's just... Here's the thing. I, am I am I alone where I, I confuse like the second move or the slow movements of Beethoven sonatas around because I like get them mixed up all the time. But you because they all sound I don't want to say the same because really nothing by Beethoven sounds the same. But they they all kind of get confusing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just the the slow movements of Beethoven don't really do me. There's a couple of them out there that really mm, that are very impactful, but uh, none so far. All right. Okay. Okay. That's that's no question. Number twenty nine. That's that's definitely top S tier. That's the Hammerklavier Sonata. Um, you know, just to honor Beethoven, you, we got to put it at the top. It was his favorite sonata when he wrote it. Um, it's the longest, most technically demanding. Um, they uh, the piano professors when I was in under oh, in un undergrad, apparently they refused to teach this sonata to their students just because it was just not worth their time. And there is a, such a risk of uh, injury to the students that they just, you know, just didn't bother teaching it. You could learn on your own, but, uh, yeah, I'm starting to, you know, I started looking at the third movement, the F sharp minor. Um, beautiful, the very long third movement, the slow movement. That is a slow movement that just is so deep. It's just, and the way he wrote it is just unfathomable. It's... And, and the structure underlying it, because it looks, if you look at it on the page, it just looks like, oh my gosh, how did he notate this? Like so cleanly and so idiomatically. Um, and then of course, you know, he's, he's not done yet. He, he then writes, you know, the finale, the, um, yeah. Uh, fun fact, apparently the first two bars of the, um, the third movement or the first bar, I should say, were added in, um, just a moment's notice before publishing or printing got underway. So it was kind of a, an afterthought, the first uh, the first bars. And it was just a very um, genius, uh, stroke of genius. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Hammer Clive is not, oh, it's such a good piece of music. And it just, you know, the older I get, the more and more I appreciate it more because you just find little nuggets of uh, of wonderful, uh, just, just, just greatness happening in there. Um, it's... It's such a good, the, the late Beethoven sonatas are, I think, some of my favorites. But we'll get to there when we get to there. All right. Um, 25. 25, that is a almost a borderline of Sonatina, the G major one. Yep. It's not too interesting. It's uh, it's a good piece of music, but it really is not saying too much. Um, low C tier. 28, the one, the the first Hammerklavier Sonata, um, the A major one. Boy, this is a good one. This is the first time Beethoven, if I get this right, it's one of the first instances where he writes a fugue in the development section. And this happens in the finale. It's a very, am I getting this right? Or I'm mixing this up with another Sonata. Uh, no, this is right. Yeah, this is a good Sonata. I, I think, oh man. It's definitely up here. I'm going to put it as a high A tier. It's S tier is really for something special. All right. 10 we've already done. Oh, 32. Okay. Oh, 32. The Opus 111. This is definitely one of those... Hmm... I love both movements of this piece. I know everyone clamors about the second movement, the aria, the aria, the arietta, not the aria, the arietta. 
And to think that he was completely deaf. Oh my gosh. You have to consider that. He was deaf. That's how good he was. He couldn't hear. He couldn't hear when he was writing this piece. At least not in the real world. And, and people say, oh, it's just here in your head. But yeah, okay, you try doing that. Write a piece of music wearing earplugs without having any kind of uh, oral stimulation. It is blisteringly difficult. Um, he was just Beethoven was just a, just a monster of a musician. Um, where do we put this one? Um, definitely an S tier, but no. Oh, okay, I'm gonna put it right there. Nothing can really touch the hammer clever. Well, maybe I don't know. Let's keep going. Okay, we're sticking to number 30. 30. I get that one in my head. Yeah, these last three scenarios are definitely up in the S tier. Mm. And then you've got that really nice. Mm. I'm going to put it down here. It's not my favorite, but it's definitely a really good one. Uh, and 31. Why did I anticipate that? 31. Okay. Um, yeah, 31. I absolutely adore because of it's such a personal piece of music, isn't it? And the contrast with the second movement, and then the third movement, which is just the most avant-garde piece of music Beethoven wrote up to that point, I think, even including the hammer clever. Uh, in terms of form, just that, that last movement with, with, with two fugues and the, and the inversion one, and, it, and, and it's, it's not a technical piece. It's, it's like this balancing of the head and the heart. It's, it's, it's such a beautiful um, work that I could just listen to over and over and over again and not get tired of it. It's also just a technical masterpiece. It's every single note has a place in its, in its own uh, on its own and it's just such a it's such a joy yeah i might rearrange these in some point but uh we're gonna have to stick with that let's see we've done a couple of these 16 16 16 why am i blinking out 16 oh 16 16 okay in g major yeah yeah, yeah. um opus 30 number one right this is a funny sonata um, not very memorable for me, to be honest. It's interesting how in the um, in the uh, in the first movement of 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 Opus Thirty One Number One, how in the exposition when the second theme comes in, he actually goes. It goes to E major, which is kind of not what you're supposed to do in a sonata. But, you know, at this point, after writing 15 sonatas, he can, I think he can kind of get away with breaking some rules. Um, you know, and then the second movement, I know this is supposed to be kind of a, uh, a tongue-in-cheek kind of sonata, but mm, it's it's kind of boring. <laughs> That's got to get there. But a high, high 16. Definitely not my least favorite. Um, all right, let's do another one. 19, ugh, whatever, 19, I just couldn't care less about these pieces, I'm sorry, these, the, the light sonata, the easy sonatas, they're not really that interesting, sorry, they're not that interesting, um, let's see, we've done a couple of these, 25 we've done, Tw oh, okay, 23, the appassionata, yes, by far one of my favorite pieces, it's, is it going to pass the hammer clever? Oh, I know it's such a popular piece. I know it's cliche, but my God, is it such a good work? It's like the embodiment of... Mm. I know I'm putting a lot of stuff in S tier, but my God, it's such a good piece. I don't know where else to put it. The second movement is glorious. Um, the the energy that comes the the brutality of the third movement in the first movement i mean they're just sandwiched in as franz Liszt said it um no no that's fine franz Liszt. we said that with a different sonata um i don't know just the the middle movement is such like this little like <laughs> the, the d flat major theme and variations is just uh 
it's like this little like coy you know um innocent little flower it's like hi don't worry about me da, 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 da. it's 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 a lovely theme too and it builds and builds it's like that moment of hope and then it just you know that diminished chord comes at the end of the second movement and really just you know the thunderstorm starts up again it's like the it's like you're in the eye of the hurricane essentially is the second movement um yeah it's it's a very deep angst filled and it's 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 just such a thrill to listen to this piece and to also play it's 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 marvelous all right the appassionata i mean i know it's cliche but there's a reason it's popular it's good number six okay number six i actually like i actually like this one this is a good piece this is going to go in a tier um i don't remember again the second movement is that the one b minor um, the, 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 the first movement is interesting. And then the last movement, the last movement, so fun. So yeah, these two are kind of right next to each other. Man, which one do I like more? C minor one or this one? Mm, that's a tough one. I'm basing them both off, both off of the last movement because they both have the same kind of energy, similar kind of energy. Um, hmm. I'm going to leave it there. Yeah, this is a great sonata. It's, it's, if nothing else, listen to the last movement. It's, it's, that, it'll just completely make your day. Um, let's see. Did we do 18? We did. We did 3. We did 5. We did 32. Yes. 22. Literally, no one likes this sonata, um, <laughs> but I'm going to give it benefit of the doubt. I'm going to stick it a little bit above here. Um, I, I, I'm kind of with everyone on this one. I just It's just one of those weird sonatas that just kind of popped out of nowhere. Um, the second movement's good. The second movement's, yeah. Yeah, that's about it. The first movement, it's just, uh, eh. You know, nothing too interesting. Da, 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 da. This is boring, boring, boring. It's just da, 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 da. yeah. I guess the ax, uh, the hemiola is kind of interesting, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't hit it doesn't really hit the feels like these other pieces do. All right, let's go. Uh, Twenty, yeah. Okay, sorry, they go next to each other. This is the second of the line. They're just not that interesting. They're just not. I'm sorry. They're just not interesting pieces. I mean, I, I don't of the of of the thirty two flavors of ice cream, you're gonna pick black licorice as your favorite. No, sorry. All right, all right, done. Twenty eight, seventeen. Okay, the Tempest Sonata, another piece I've played back in my college days. Uh, I actually do like this piece. It's not my favorite, but uh, hmm. And then the second movement. The beautiful thing about the second movement is that B flat major roll. Da -da 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 -da. That begins the second movement because it really kind of bookends the the first movement where it begins with a nice roll and there's some really it's a geeky composery sonata uh, the Tempest but uh, there's more potent music out there from Beethoven where should I put this um, you know I haven't put enough in mm, I'm gonna do this I'm gonna move some stuff around. I'm gonna do this. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Let's see. Oh, okay, the pathetic number eight, right? Number eight, actually, that's okay. It's good. You know, it's it's one of those well-rounded snides, isn't it? Where every, there's there's not like a weak movement in there that you forget. I mean, you have the the turbulent first movement. You have the um. The very nice second movement, the very lyrical second movement, I should say. And then you've got this nice little light um, third movement to kind of cap off the piece. So, huh. I'm going to put this. It's definitely a memorable piece. Maybe an A tier. Mm, put it around here. I think that'll be good. Let me see if I can rearrange some of this stuff. I'm actually going to shove these down here. Yeah, demote them. 
Same with this. Oh, I don't know. I'll just leave it like that. Okay, let's keep going. I have to click a little bit. Okay, 12. A flat major, the funeral march one. A flat major. Uh, the interesting thing about this sonata is this was written without any sonata form. Uh, yeah, it was called Sonata. Kind of an interesting thing to do at the time. Begins with the theme variations, um, which is not really very normal. Uh, I don't really... I think there's a Mozart Sonata that begins... Oh, is it the Turkish March? It's the Turkish March um, Sonata by Mozart. What is that? K331? I don't remember the K numbers. The Kirkpatrick numbers by Mozart. Um, or the Kerschel numbers? Kirkpatrick or Kerschel? Whatever. Kerschel? Yeah, it's Kerschel, isn't it? Um, yeah, I don't remember the K numbers by Mozart, but anyway, it's the, that begins with the theme variations. Um, you have the funeral march and then you have this really interesting textural, uh, fourth movement to kind of cap it all off. Hmm. Maybe a solid B tier. I actually definitely like it above all these other ones, but not too much to put in B, or A tier, rather. All right, oh, we've done 16, let's see, 24, oh, 24, you know, that's such a nice sonata, isn't it? The F sharp major. As far as I'm aware, I don't know if there's any other piano sonata to that point, I'm sure there was, um, but as far as I can recall, um, this is what, 1809? Nine or 1808 or 1807, somewhere around there when this piece was written. Um, it's a very nice little, it's a nice little sonata. It's, uh, and Beethoven even really liked this sonata. Uh, apparently he played this all the time. But yeah, F sharp major, think about F sharp major, if you're a musician, it's got six sharps. Uh, it's quite a lot of sharps. You have to read double sharps a lot of the times and, you know, weird spellings, but uh, it's really not that difficult um, once you understand how key signatures work. Um, it becomes pretty simple, but I'm going to give it a solid, I'm going to put it right below number 12. Yeah. Before I've done that, seven. Okay, seven. Oh, is this the one with the D minor? I always forget which one has the slow D, the really deep D minor second movement. I think it's this one. Um... I had a piano professor in my undergrad, and she was a big Beethoven scholar. Um, she writes, actually, for the uh, Beethoven Journal, if I recall. And she, I remember having a coffee with her one day, and she, you know, I asked her, you know, do you have, do you have any Beethoven piano sonatas that resonate with you a lot? And she said this one. I forgot her reasoning, though, but I just, I, I, I couldn't, un I couldn't understand why this was her favorite, though. Um, I, if, to me, it's not my favorite, uh, but it just shows you that everyone's got, you know, everyone's got their own opinions. But, um, hmm. This one's not bad, though. Number seven's not bad. It's okay. Um, C tier. Oh, definitely, I... Yeah, that seems about right. What would I hear anymore? I'm going to demote this one again to C tier just because which way I'd rather listen to number 15 or number seven and listen to 15. I would definitely listen to this more than any of these other sonatas. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. We've done 17. We've done four. And 20. Have we done 20? Yes. We're just missing a handful of them left, so I'm going to have to click until we hit one. Oh, come on. 27. Here we go. 27. Another two movement. He wrote uh, quite a handful of two movement piano sonatas. This one's interesting. This is uh, kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of sonata, at least the first movement is. And then you've got this beautiful lyrical second movement. Um, yeah, the second movement is really nice. It's a great, it's a very romantic era, uh, forward looking, 
uh, piece of music. Hmm. Probably put in B tier. Very strong B tier. High B tier. Nine. We just have these last three left. All right. Let's see. Yeah, we've got two of the big ones and then this one. So, all right, here we go. 21. Waldstein Sonata. Oh, my gosh. If you're having a bad day and you want to feel better, you listen to this piece. Um, S tier. Hands down. Hands down S tier. Yeah, these are just complete contrasting pieces of music. You have number 21, the joyous of joys, and then number 23, the, the most angst filled of angst i guess um yeah that last movement oh my god it's so good it just makes you feel so good i love the waldstein sonata and again it is also another one of those popular you know the waldstein and, and the appassionata very popular all right how fitting is it that the moonlight is left to almost the last one let's see which one i'm going to keep going actually I'll, I'll pull it up to you so you know that i'm not like I'm I'm just clicking through here. Let's see. Is it going to be four? Oh, it is 14. There we go. Finally, we got 14. All right. The Moonlight Sonata. What do I think about the Moonlight Sonata? The Beethoven's most popular piano sonata. And it was actually one of the most popular pieces of music that was uh, written in his lifetime. Um, And I've played the sonata a lot. And everyone knows the sonata. And Beethoven said that he's written better. He preferred the F-sharp major sonata to this one um hmm how can i it's it's so hard to separate this sonata from you know the reputation that it has um sonata cause una fantasia or the uh oh there's a there's another word for it that was called there's another nickname for it but oh boy um the first movement's cool um, but I think I've just become so, you know, inert to the first movement just because it's been played so many times. It's like when you listen to a piece too many times, you know, no matter how good the piece of music is, it just becomes just, you know, ugh, it just becomes dead. It becomes meaningless. Um, kind of like I can't stand listening to Free Elise. Like, please just, ugh, you know, it's one of those kind of things. Uh, the first movement of this isn't that bad. Um, but man, oh man, the last movement, what a thrill, isn't it? I'm going to put an A tier. I think I'm going to put it. Oh, I'm be honest. I'll, I'll probably put it there. Yeah. I'd rather listen to any of these over that. And then number 13, <laughs> we come from the most popular to probably one of the least popular sonatas finishing up number 13, E flat major also on the same opus number of 27, number one. We're going to actually throw it in here because it's pretty boring, the first movement. Oh. Uh, the second movement kind of gets going. And then the third movement yeah, has a little introduction that leads to a little bit more animated of a of a finale but really nothing that special so yeah so i think that's where i'm gonna put everything and um there you have it so awesome so i think that'll do it for t me for today so if you like this video go ahead and leave a like um subscribe if you haven't already please subscribe that really helps me know that i'm doing a good job and uh, it's free yeah it's free so go ahead and punch that subscribe button um, and maybe I'll do more of these kind of videos in the future if you guys enjoy it. So uh, with that said, I will see you guys next time. Take care.